believe it's... I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and first order of business, uh, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll? Certainly, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Branstad. Here. Secretary Gorton, I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky. I'm here. Member Baker. Here. Member McFarland. It's not here this evening. Mm -hmm. Member Singer, here. Yep, and Scott designated his absence, so. Thank you, we have a quorum. Uh, first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. It includes the uh, meeting minutes from last week. Uh, three teacher recommended hires for this year. Eight resignations, approvals. And <coughs> approvals spend $49,000 on some new projectors that have HDMI connectors and much cheaper light bulbs. Uh, as we go forward, these are uh, aged equipment that needs to be replaced and would be in con would be uh, integrated into any new technology we do in the future. And then uh, also legal bills uh, totaling about five hundred and seventy dollars. Any additions, deletions, or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none. Uh, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.6. I'll second that. Moved by by Angela and second and second seconded by Pam. I'm sorry tonight. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. <coughs> now we'll move on to request to address the board. We have no formal requests this evening, but anybody would care to come to the podium to address us, uh, five minute limit please, and name your, give us your name and your school attendance area. No volunteers, we'll move on. Uh, the first thing is uh, Board of Education Matters, and we're gonna give it to Mike for October Shining Star presentations. Shining Stars. Um, the first one we have today is absent, but Blake's gonna step in for him. So Blake, if you wanna come up, and except for Gary Se Siebert. Gary Siebert began his employment with Mid Midland Public Schools in 1990 as a custodian. In 1998, he joined the technology department as a computer technician. Gary is a valued member of the information technology team in his current role as workstation work specialist. Gary has an outstanding work ethic, provides excellent customer service to both students and staff. Gary is very conscientious when it comes to doing quality work. He has an excellent customer-oriented focus and works dil diligently to support his customers here at MPS. Gary never procrastinates when new jobs or projects are presented to him, the weather Rather, he is one of the first to jump into a new task and make sure it gets done properly. Gary was nominated for the Shining Star Award by a number of his MPS colleagues. Among their comments, the staff members wrote, Gary Siebert is such a pleasant, patient technology specialist. He was one of the nicest people I've ever worked with. When he is in the building repairing computers, hooking up new computers, returning computers, or just making sure everything is working well, he does not hesita hesitate to help out when asked. One day this school year, Gary was being pulled in four different directions by numerous staff members. He kept a smile on his face and a positive attitude. Gary was our shining star. He started our day on a great note because our technology issues were resolved with such kindness and patience. Gary is always polite to staff, saying hello with a smile on his face. He never appears upset, competes all jobs with kindness. Gary is definitely a shining star. So congratulations, Gary. Shake Gary's hand for me. You brought Gary along just well. <laughs> and our second Shining Star employee is here. It's Christy Hanstock. If Christy would come up. And why uh, Christy comes up, I'll start reading. Dr. Christy Hanstock is a psychologist with Midland Public Schools. She began her career with MPS just a little little over one year ago. Before coming to MPS, Christy was with Bryan Center Public Schools in Bryan Center, Michigan. Christy Hanstock graduated from Central Michigan Univers University with a PhD in school psychology in 2011. She is a certified school psychologist with the Michigan Department of Education as well as holding a national certification as a school psychologist. Christy was nominated for the Shining Star Award by a number of MPS colleagues. Some of their comics include, Christy took the initiative to obtain volunteers to help with student assignments. She collaborated with CMU to obtain interns pursuing a degree in school psychology to assist our buildings with Dibbles testing. 
as well as school-wide administration of the curriculum-based measures in math and reading. Christy has done a wonderful job since joining our staff. In addition to her regular duties, Christy is a, num is a member of the instructional c consultation team. Communication among special services staff and teachers has improved because of Christy's willingness to help and share information. Christy is always willing to work with teachers and students. Christy mentors a, stu a student during her lunch hour. Christy has done and continues to do a wonderful job as a school psychologist with Midland Public Schools. She provides any additional assistance that is asked from her from her team in the buildings that she serves. She p possesses a great attitude and consistently goes the extra mile for those she works with. She has assisted with developing and improving practices at our school. She has worked with students in one-to-one -one settings to provide extra support. She is a phenomenal asset to the district in which she serves. Congratulations, Christy. Congratulations, Christy. And our um, next group is the hyphenated IB teachers. I think they introduced themselves <laughs> in my group. And so we, uh, uh, we have um, both Robin and Ellen back again this year. I, and I'll turn it over to them. That's right. I forgot that. All right, well, we're happy to be the hyphenated sisters back here. It's been a year. Glad that you remembered that little bit about us. It's been a year in our journey, as we've um, called it, and we thought about ways to share that with you, and we've decided that images and pictures can sometimes say a lot more than words, especially when they come from children. So we created a type of movie last year to celebrate our year together with our staffs and all the work that they have done they had done and how much we had grown. So we modified that a little bit to share with you tonight um, to see where our journey is. And then we're gonna share some things with you afterwards of what's to come and some of those highlights.
Linda Lipsitz and I invited Robin and Ellen to come in tonight to share all of the great things that have been happening because they're responsible for all of it. They're doing a great job planning. Our PDs are phenomenal. Um, you saw a couple of passport reflections in there where the teachers are saying, thank you for making me a better teacher. And it's going really well. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do, you have a handout um, that was given to you. Just of some highlights, a few of them I'd like to go over. Uh, the first one being uh, the greater sense of collaboration that we're seeing among teachers and students, where group work is more intentional, more productive. Students having a voice within their classrooms in the school and are being encouraged to take positive actions connected to their learning. And sometimes we have to limit that because they're really starting to grab a hold of it and coming up with an action for everything that we're doing. Uh, the emphasis on inquiry and constructivist teaching. It allows for differentiation to meet the needs of all of our students because as you know, uh, the school-wide implementation of this is for all students. One thing um, that was kind of rewarding, I had a couple families returning from overseas this year and coming back, letting me know that they're really excited about Midland and the elementary buildings becoming PYP schools because they had experienced that overseas. Um, and the last one I want to share with you is the higher level of student engagement that we're seeing. And there has always been, the teachers always tell the kids there's never just one answer. Uh, sometimes I think that's hard to believe. We always think we want to just be right and get the right answer. And I think this lends itself a little bit more to that. And um, kids are more, um, feel more safe, I think, in sharing and talking. And it's just been a great thing for kids in our building. Mrs. Renfro mentioned, um, it's really just exciting to see the impact within our classrooms already. This is the first year that they're trying out more of the pieces beyond developing the essential agreements, um, looking at the unit they developed. Some are in the process of teaching that. They're all, all the teachers are busy working on the subsequent five to create this year as well. But I think when you walk in the buildings, you'll see that classrooms in general have shifted in that process. There's always been great student engagement in our schools and in our classrooms. But I think it's that level of the students um, bringing forth their ideas. Tracy mentioned that earlier, but I agree. I think that's a big shift that we see on a more daily basis. There's always been opportunities for that, but it's getting to be sort of the norm where they can ask questions and, and bridge off something, um, which is wonderful to see. The way students work is showcased. Often you'll see pieces where they've been able to take it out into the community or something that they want to comment on, and they'll bring that in in their writing. Um, and making those connections within their social studies to their language arts, whether that's been part of the discussion or not. When I walk in classrooms, you kind of see the aha, and they, uh, they share that part, so that's wonderful to see. And I think the part about that taking action based on their learning, it can be a small act at home or in the classroom or in our community, but we do see that going on. Continue to make those connections to our world, too. Um, that was one thing that I noticed in one of the classrooms I went in to observe last week. There was uh, a challenge from the Imagination Foundation called Kane's Arcade Global Challenge, where students take cardboard and, and create different designs and um, movement and s science and social studies combined. And then they had to share their creations and their development behind it, the, the math behind it, the science behind the the pieces that they made with the community. So they took it into the gym and parents came in and community people came in to check it out. But it was a, a neat way, that was something that a student brought in as an idea that they'd seen online. Um, similar to the ALS kind of challenge, but in a different kind of way for the kids. It was to get them more engaged in the classroom. And that was a great example of how we're seeing that change in our buildings now. I'll turn it back over to Robin and to Ellen who will kind of wrap things up for us but as Tracy said they've done a stellar job just pulling the teachers together maintaining that focus being positive under Luann's leadership it's been a really um, exciting adventure so far okay so that's all great and good but now it's the next steps because this journey this journey is long okay so we, we've done one year we're starting the um, second year as what's called a candidate school and when you become a candidate school, you are assigned an IB consultant for each of the buildings. Uh, Plymouth and Woods, Woodcrest have a consultant that is in Canada. So um, it's interesting to kind of interact with her. Chestnut Hill and Adams, their consultant is from Florida and just coincidentally, 
he happened to be one of the trainers that trained 72 of our teachers in the summer, which was kind of the luck of the draw. I said to Robin, it wasn't really fair, but I'd try to work through it. <laughs> well, and I tried to say he liked me best, but he said it really was the luck of the draw. But, <laughs> but I say that who wouldn't like Alan best anyway? So um, along with the consultant, what they give to us is 20 hours of remote time, which means whether that's through email, Skyping, conferencing in some ways, advice. Um, I thought at one point I had scared him away with my questions, but he was just busy traveling. So we, they are very good about getting back to us about questions um, as we're working with staff and as we kind of learn our way through this whole process as well. Um, and then we also each, for each building, we have a two-day visit with that consultant. Um, I think our consultants have both chosen to do it in two separate times rather than doing a four-day stretch. Um, they will come, they will visit with each school, they will talk to parents and staff and just visit. And um, my consultant, Chris, has called it. He said he's just coming for feedback to feed forward. So that is all in preparation for when we are applying for our authorization, which will be in October of 2015. I think I skipped one, sorry. Oh, okay, so that, that projected date would be October of 2015. And so as we build with our action plan, um, he will help and support us, and so will Ellen's consultant and give us feedback for that. And along with that, we, Robin and I, um, will continue to collect and develop supporting documents as well as work to complete the criteria that's within our action plan. In order to become a candidate school, we have to craft an action plan. And timelines and all of that good stuff in there and so we will continue to work on that and check those boxes to show that we've done that as we move forward and we are also in the process which just last Friday with our large PD of five hours we were able to finally craft our program of inquiry which within the PYP language is our written curriculum there's written taught and assessed so this will be the written curriculum for each grade level and so it really, if you saw in the movie, it's that grid piece where it's really um, the heart of what we will be teaching with the curriculum. And so each grade level took their six themes, took their curriculum and started to craft central ideas, which really is the heart of their six plan, their plans for their units of inquiry. So we started that, which was a huge project and undertaking. So it's really a first draft now, but that for us, um, that's been something that we've been building for the last year to get to, so it was really a celebration for us to have that up and for teachers to see and be able to reflect about what that looks like. And I think there were some powerful moments where teachers said, I really can see where they have been and where they're headed now, and we're able to have conversations in different ways that we haven't had to, been, haven't had in the past, so that's been exciting for us. So anyway, following now the creation of what's called the POI, so when you hear that term, the POI, that's the program of inquiry, which is the six themes with the six central ideas for each grade level. To support that, um, teachers have a lot of work to do because for every one of those six ideas, they have to write what's called a um, unit of inquiry on a planner. And so the teachers and the coordinators meaning the two of us, we continue to meet weekly or bi-weekly to write and refine these six units of inquiry. So there's one for each um, transdisciplinary theme. And some of the grade levels have taken their first planner, which they wrote in the spring, and have um, implemented it, have taught it. So actually, at Plymouth, I think two of the grade levels are in the very last days of teaching their first unit. And they were here, I'm sure they would tell you that it was a really exciting process. They liked teaching it. It forced collaboration amongst them when it worked and when it um, didn't work. And I think they're really excited to write the next one so that they can teach that as well. And then we just continue to collaborate with one another. Um, with our grade level teams, Ellen and I collaborate, and we also are collaborating with our new phase two schools with those two coordinators as well. 
we coordinate with our sister schools and collaborate, and we, one of our goals in our action plan is to reach out and communicate more clearly with community groups, running misconceptions they may have, and so we're starting to do that, as well as educate our families, which tonight is a great opportunity to do as well. And those are our next steps. So, do you have any questions for us? I do. Thank you for getting us this far. I remember over a year ago, we did so much preparation at the board level, administration level, so thanks for getting us here. The uh, Having two students that are uh, getting exposure to the PYP, if you ask them about their lear what their learner profile is, if you ask them about uh, some of the ways that they can collaborate, work with other students to get answers, and kind of the worldly global view, they get it. And so, so what I'm hearing is, is that teachers are seeing the, the relevance and the value to improve teacher effectiveness and teaching effectiveness. Students are getting it, because I know that. I ask questions a little here and there. I see little things in the Friday folders and things like that. But from a parent's perspective, average parent perspective, do they really, they really see much difference in their, their elementary kids' education? Because the, the way that they're going about doing things in school is different. The students get it, <coughs> teachers get it, but parents, they hear enough about it, a little here and there, but in a way it's kind of blended in so effortlessly. And it, it seems like it's not changed a whole lot, because I know some, one of the fears of elementary parents is, well, this is going to really be a rigorous curriculum and it's going to change a lot what we do. But it seems like from the public perspective and parent perspective, it's really kind of blended in very nicely. I mean, is that kind of what you're well, feeling I is? Would is say, I would say no apprehensiveness or worry about... I would say for the teachers that have actually taught a unit, so that would be where you would see the biggest shift. I mean, I think most of the kids have really latched onto the learner profile, and I think mm -hmm. they can all describe that to you, and they yep. can use it, and they can know when you're being principled, and they can know when you're being caring. I, I think they're good with that. Mm -hmm. And I think the um, teaching of the unit, um, what I saw um, at Plymouth in, in some of the classrooms was the, the kids were just really excited because mm -hmm. so much more of the learning and the creating was on them. And th they really kind of got that. And they were like, are we doing social studies now? Are we doing social studies now? And um, that was exciting. And it was exciting for the teachers because they were motivated by the kids' enthusiasm to keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll see some things that may look different as we um, write and teach more of the units. So that might look, I don't know, a little bit different. But no parent apprehensiveness, or I, I don't know if many of them really thought that it's going to radically change elementary education, but it's just changed, made it's it a little bit better. Just taking what we do and put it in a different framework. Yeah, that's what we did. We took mm -hmm. all of our curriculum off the shelf, reorganized it, put mm -hmm. it back in, in a different way, and hopefully connected it more thoroughly so that children can make connections as they build their knowledge. Who are the sister schools that you mentioned? Well, Plymouth, Plymouth and Woodcrest share me, okay. <laughs> and Jessa Hill and Adam share Robin. And so when we do PD, they travel to one or the other school so that we can um, be together for the two hours. So we refer to them as our sister school. Okay. I loved seeing the collaboration, not just in the, in the classroom with the students, but then in, in the professional development with the teachers then to see such positive comments on you know, the excitement of the teachers with the program too is encouraging. Um, it, it and we all felt pretty proud on Friday yes. when that um, program of inquiry went up on the walls. So we were, we were pretty excited. Very good. I was going to ask you, what do you like best about this kind of teaching? You may have already answered that though. I would say for myself, I see my child, I have one child who missed this who's now a sixth grader, and I have a third grader who's in the midst of this. And what I see is, while they've both had excellent educations in Midland, what I see in my younger daughter is more connecting things together, more asking questions, and more collaborating with her fellow students. And I think that makes it more powerful. And as we do these units, really creating these hooks for children 
in, ter in terms of teaching rather than just topics and teaching conceptually, that we're really providing them a scaffold to really build information rather than just have memorization of facts. And for me, as when I was in the classroom, um, th th these are the times that we get really jealous of our teachers because we would have loved to have gotten it right. You know, we were maybe almost there, but there are things now that we would refine and do differently, and that's one of the things for me that I would love to go back and do. And we have opportunities to visit classrooms, but it's really an exciting time, I think, to be a teacher in Midland Public Schools. And I, and I think probably for me the only thing I would add to that is I, I just love the whole global perspective of this, and I love watching the kids discover like what their heritage is or what their ancestry is and things about their culture. And when you go into the classrooms, you see all kinds of world maps and kids interacting with those um, maps, and that's really exciting to me. Thank you. I was going to comment on that. When I've been in some of the buildings, it is really fun to see what you've got on the wall. You know, there were always projects and lots of fun things on the school walls, but how it's all been integrated in the learner. I'm, I'm learning the learning profiles, you know, when I go in and see those. And, and so I, I thank you for all your leadership and, and everybody that's involved. You must be just so proud of how far you've come and what the future holds for you and the students. So I look, I look forward to, to seeing more come, coming down the pike. I have three quick ones. Um, <coughs> Talk to me a little bit about how you're managing the grade level interface. You know, if I have a different, you know, grade level taking their curriculum and molding it in a framework and a, another one, how do we, how are you assuring as the kid moves on to the next year, they're seeing a continuum of approach? Is there, is there any issue there? Well, that's the power of the program of inquiry that we're building yeah. to make sure, we have to make sure that you are aligning all of the concepts and content within that. And then not only within your grade level, but then across all of the grade levels. Okay, that's what I was looking and for. And so now. that's a really powerful visual, not only for your, your grade level, but to see where your whole school falls into that, so that those things don't happen. Okay, that, that was my question. And this is almost John's question, but I'll ask it again anyway. What, what is the most frequent or loudest parent concern you've heard going through all this? I would say that there has, in early stages, was a misconception that it was more of a high school program shoved down to an elementary program. And so I think we've done a lot of work where I think that that has kind of gone away a bit. Um, but that, I think, would be the main issue that you kind of heard from people. And once you explain it, they're like, oh, okay. They've been very receptive to that and understanding. But it did take some time and education to put that out there. Okay. And then... Um for you and your staff, your, your teachers throughout the, that are doing all this, what's the biggest ahas you've had? I think, I, I think some of the biggest ahas is are that that we've looked, we've always taught things kind of as a topic. So I'll I'll just use having been a former fifth grade teacher, I know that best. So I, I'm just going to go with that. You teach the American Revolution in fifth grade. Okay, when I taught fifth grade, I taught the American Revolution and I taught all the glicks and standards that I needed to, to cover. If I was doing it now, I would frame that American Revolution more in a context of revolution. Okay, and we would make it a little bit more significant and relevant to the world in which we live in, that it wasn't just something that happened back here and we would make a connection perhaps to our world that we live in today and that revolution is a, is a means to bring about change. And that would be, to me, a kind of great aha moment and very powerful for the kids because you're connecting it to their world. So for me, that's probably the biggest aha. She stole mine. <laughs> we think so much the same. And I, was, I already had my butterflies in migration from third grade example, where we taught the butterflies, we taught about migrating to the west, but we didn't necessarily connect them. And what a powerful connection to see. It's not just insects that migrate, but people. And to talk about that at the same time, rather than as two separate units at two separate times, science time, social studies time. So I think really making those connections has been really powerful for students and for teachers. Thank you. Any others? Do, do you run into issues with, I mean, you're talking about inquiry and how, you know, kids come up with their own things. 
Do you ever worry about time issues? Because on the flip side of that, I always hear this, you know, we have so much curriculum that we have to get through, and sometimes it's hard to get through. And so if people are starting to go off, how are you trying to make sure that, you know, you still get through everything you need to get through? Because it, it's, you know, I mean, I love the concept of being able to inquire and go off, you know, in different directions, but it seems like the challenge would be to pair that with also making sure you get through all the curriculum. Well, the good news is that our teachers are the experts in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So they have crafted a central idea that is big and conceptual. And then underneath that, they create three lines of inquiry. So PYP is really structured inquiry. It's not okay. just open, go wherever you want. But the nice part is, is that in I would say nearly every classroom now, there is a wonder wall which you saw a picture of. So if while you are doing whatever the activity is, whatever the lesson is, and you as the student have a question or some idea, you now have a place that you can post that. Okay, and then the teacher and the student can kind of follow up and see where that might go. Whereas before, I don't think there was an outlet that was as obvious as it is now. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not for tonight, but for everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And at this point, we'll move on to curriculum. Brian, I'll hand it over. Oh, I guess I'm going to hand it to Lynn first for a study committee report on curriculum. Alrighty. We met here on Monday, September 22nd, and we started out with talking about the curriculum office reorganization and Brian Burton shared a flowchart describing the reorganization of the curriculum office structure and personnel. There will be subject specific administrators that have been placed, replaced with administrators in charge of levels, for example elementary, secondary, career and graduation and auxiliary. The administrators are supported by teacher leader ones and teacher leader twos that are level and content specific. Office professionals and administrative assistants were realigned accordingly. Next, we went into the 2013-14 MPS data review. First up was MEET and MME trends. And uh, presentation of these scores by Brian revealed that the historical trend of significant, significantly outpacing sta state averages by 10 to 20 percent, approximately across grade and content levels, continues which is very good news. Accountability <coughs> scorecards. Brian shared the Midland Depart Midland Michigan Department of Education accountability scorecard data with the group. And some of the major po data points presented included the following, that nine MPS schools were given a yellow rating, two Adams and Carpenter Street School received a lime rating. Individual subject area scorecards revealed that MPS performed beyond proficiency target goals in every all students category. Specific focus on subgroup proficiency targets that were not met will be a top priority through the 2014-15 school year. And then we went on to the top to bottom and focus schools. As part of the presentation, Brian reviewed annual top to bottom rankings. MPS has three schools above the 90th percentile, four between the 80th and 90th percentile, and two between the 70th and 80th percentile one between the 60th and 50th, and one between the 40th and 50th. This is the third year of the MDE determining and labeling schools as reward, focus, and priority schools. For th this year, Carpenter Street Elementary and Midland High schools were determined to be focus schools, reducing the number of identified focus schools from five in 2012-13 to two in 14-15. And a special note, significant changes coming to the state assessments were briefly discussed. The changes are scheduled to be reviewed by the November meeting and uh, once details become more readily available from the Midland Michigan Department of Education. Next, Brian reviewed established goals and initiatives for the curriculum division for the 2014-15 school year. And then we discussed uh, topics and places that we would like to visit for future committee meetings. And there are a whole variety that we have uh, down on our calendar for the uh, rest of the year. And these minutes, and with, with a lot of this 
information about where we will be meeting and the topics is out in the hallway if you choose to um, read it in its entirety. Thank you. Any questions for Lynn? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now we'll move on to finance and facilities and operations. Oh, got to got our study report too. I keep <laughs> we've got so many now. All right. We met on September 23rd. Um, and is this our normal meeting? I can't remember if it was a yes. special one. This was our normal meeting. Uh, Mr. Sharo shared recent work done by French Associates, the architectural firm, and Barton Mallow, who's the construction management firm, on the possible February bond ballot proposal to upgrade and update MPS facilities. The committee studied the scope of possible, bo possible bond work across the district and considered various bond financial scenarios. We will continue in preparation for a meeting with the Michigan Department of Treasury, which is this Wednesday, October 15th. And our next meeting will be Tuesday, October 20th. Any questions? I was there, that's why I forgot to have you read that. Now I'll turn it over to Paul. Well, I have a long list here, all guests, which is good news. So I'm going to start uh, with 62 here. These are 13 gifts totaling uh, $12,229. A variety of, uh, of gifts from different organizations and also to two different organizations in our school system. Uh, first gift, uh, $2,860 from the Middle and Gowanus Foundation for East Lawn uh, for a We Do Lego education program. You'll see a $200 donation anonymously to Siebert Elementary for their various programs there. Uh, $500 donation from Mr. and Mrs. Aaron Oberlin for the Midland High Student Positive Outcomes Program. Then you'll see three uh, gifts total about $2,600 from the uh, H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club. Uh, one's for soccer, one's volleyball, and one is for varsity sports uh, in general. There are two more following, one from $1,000 for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Alan Ott, and then another one for $1,000 from the Gerstacker Foundation. Those are both for the H.H. Uh, Dow uh, High School Debate Program. Um, there is a $2,290 one from Memorial Presbyterian Church for Carpenter Street School Programs. Uh, there's two more there for $800 to Jefferson Theater for Jefferson Groups. One is the Jefferson Music Parents, and the other one is the Jefferson Parent Advisory Committee. Um, there's $369 uh, from the Eastland Elementary uh, study Supplement Education Endowment Fund uh, for science equipment. And there is a $598 uh, gift from Mimic Foundation for Future of Education, and that's for the Midland High Math Department that's doing a, a mosaic tiling of pot. So that's what they're working on. The next item is a donation in lieu of cash there. You, you might have already seen it around. Uh, the H.H. Down Music Booster Club, and the sponsors listed below, and there's quite a few there, so I'll just refer people to the agenda. And they had numerous uh, anonymous don donors. They donated an equipment trailer. Uh, you might have seen it around because it's not just an ordinary one. It's got a very nice, uh, I call it a wrap all the way around mm -hmm. uh, with graphic designs on it. And in fact, I thought it was kind of interesting. They had uh, students in graphic arts class uh, design the wrap that goes around that. So um, they've, they've used it, I think, a couple times already. Um, but they donated the, the trailer to MPS. Uh, we do have two gifts there that require board action because of the amount of money involved. And when it goes towards to follow our purchasing regulations, so uh, I will need board action on 6.4. There are two gifts totaling $18,641. Uh, $5,340 uh, from the Boosters Club for Cross Country Program. Uh, those are the uniforms. And then a $13,300 donation from an anonymous donor for no chairs uh, for Northeast sixth grade classrooms. So I would need board action on those two items. Um, I'll call for a motion and we'll do questions. Anybody would like a motion on both? I uh, move both to donations? move to approve item 6.4 for both donations. Support. So we have we have motion and support. Uh, now questions. What is a no chair? Mm -hmm. I think we are on that. <laughs> <right. laughs> a good question. Uh, it's just the style. Of, it's a the design. It's by steel case, but it is. Um, I guess I would call it highly mobile. It's on casters, so they can easily take the chairs, and the, the desktop goes with them. In fact, the desktops that I saw actually had a couple of them or two, 
So they could easily take, and they're planning on putting, I think it's like six to seven in each of their sixth grade classrooms. And so they can put a, a quick group together, say off in a corner or out in the hall, and they're easy. It's not like taking a big desk like we would have and dragging it out to the hallway. So they're very quickly to be able to organize into learning areas and group work. And so it's a, a pretty well designed chair, like I said, on casters. Um, with the kind of integrated desktop with that. Cool. Mr. Walton, I'm sorry. Can I support this? Oh, I think it was Yvonne, correct? No, it's Pam. Oh, it's Pam. I'm sorry. I motioned. Pam motioned. Oh, I'm Pam sorry. Angela. 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 We got to take care of that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her the hand. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, I looked up the node chairs, too. I, I actually uh, sat in one earlier in the year and they're pretty neat, they're pretty comfortable and easy to move and uh, I read a little bit about how other schools were using them for more collaboration, uh, just how you can quickly move together and in different uh, scenarios depending on what you're learning in your class and it looks like a great, great chair. And multicolored. I forget how many, I think they're ordering different set six in one color and that concern. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. Any other questions? See, now we'll move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And thank you to your donors. Mm -hmm. All of them, the whole list. Um, now we're moving on to 6.5. Yep, we have one more here, our stop loss insurance coverage. Uh, as you know, we are self-insured and have been that since November 1st of <coughs> 2000. And self-insured for everybody just means that <coughs> instead of paying premiums, we are, are paying all the payments uh, ourselves as a district provide the funds for those claims. That's been a very uh, uh, cost-cutting measure for us, been good for us. But one of the things we've done from the start is try to protect ourselves from catastrophic claims, either individually or as a group. And as it says in the notes here, since we've done this, our stop-loss payments have been around $1.8 million, which stop-loss just simply says we're going to insure ourselves, so if it goes over this amount of money, then we have an insurance that kicks in. And it has paid off, as you can see, like I said, through the years. So it's that time again where we have to renew that as we get started here. Uh, we did uh, put out bids um, by our uh, Connect Care and our key benefit administrators did that for us. Um, the same company that had our, uh, our uh, business last year was the only bidder. I asked a little bit about that so you know. Um, typically they say that when they know your uh, uh, claim history, when they know what you've been paying, when they know there's a, a, a process called lasering, if you have a people or, or persons with certain conditions, they will uh, kind of laser around that person to tell you, yes, here's what we'll pay, but not in this case. And they said in those cases, when they know that much information, they usually will make a quick decision on whether it's worthwhile to bid, like they could keep that bid or not. So that's not unusual in this area, not to get bids once they know a lot about you. I did include a table so you could see uh, between last year and this year. Um, as you can see, uh, the costs are uh, up, but uh, that's kind of typical of where we've been with some of our medical costs as we, as we go. So that's uh, nothing uh, unusual. The only thing that they did propose is you could go with a higher stop loss uh, insurance, meaning a higher uh, break point. This one is for $250,000. We went to 350000 um, As we looked at that, we really didn't think with where our fund equity is at this time that this would be the time we'd say, right. let's push that. So there might come a time where, you know, by changing that part of it, we could save some money, but I don't think it's in our best interest right now to do that. So it's the recommendation of the administration to uh, approve this from Munich Re for the 12-month period that would begin November uh, 1st, 2014. I'll take a motion and support, and then we can have questions. I move we <coughs> um, approve item 6.5, the staff loss insurance coverage. I'll support that. I'll support by mm -hmm. Questions? I do have one. Bob, how have these guys been to work with? Been good this past year. The this, this year past year was the first year right. that we were with them, and we have not had any problems with and we had some claims that high, right? Did we have um, an individual I'd have to claim? go back and check. I think we had at least one. At least one that I know of. Okay. 
And remember, there's that corridor there that yeah, the first claim has to go 50,000 right. more than that, and then after that, it comes back to the two. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No, it's not just opine quickly. I love doing this. I love the self-insurance with the stop loss. It saves us a lot of money through the years. And, uh, it's worthwhile. You're just betting it's going to happen. They're betting. They're betting it's going to. You're betting it's not going to happen. They're betting it is, and, and it's worked out for us. So that's a good deal. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to human resources. We have a study committee report. And that would have been Mr. McCullough. Do you want me to read oh, we don't have one. Yeah, we do. Do you want me to go ahead yeah, and go read ahead, it Lance. since I was there? Yep. <coughs> All right. The human resources study committee met on Thursday, October 9th. And we uh, covered several topics. The first was a legal update by Mr. Berlundi, who informed the committee of a pending lawsuit. Then there was a workers' compensation case that Ms. Marchese updated the committee on a workers' comp case. Then we received the internal staffing report for 2014-15, and it was reviewed. This document reflects the staffing levels for the current school year and the previous four school years. Overall, the district is down 33.39 total FTE from 2013-14. And next, Ms. Marchais informed the committee of a grievance. And lastly, the district will be negotiating with the three affiliated groups, MCEA, MSESPA, and MFP this school year. All of the contracts expire in 2015. And we will meet again on December 11th. Any questions for Lynn? Seeing none, I'll move over to Mr. Orlando. Thank you. We have one retirement, effective as of uh, September 29th, Sandra Nava Moreno, our professional at Chestnut Hill. And the board and staff extend their deepest sympathies to the family of Mrs. Shar V. Evans, who passed away September 26th. She began her employment with Midland Public Schools in 1966 and her entire Midland Public School teacher career was spent at Alan Adams Elementary. She retired in 1987. Thank you. Our condolences to the family. Um, that moves us into correspondence to the board. You can see those listed in the agenda. And our scheduled meetings, just to be clear, we have our regularly scheduled meetings coming up in November and December, but we also have a couple special meetings in October and November yet coming up concerning our millage application, et cetera. So just wanted to highlight that that's there. With that, we'll move into study discussion session. I'll begin to my right. Start with Angela. All right, just a few things. First, I um, left a soccer game to, came here, to come here. Districts are sharding tonight. I'm assuming Dow High won um, their soccer game. They were winning eight to two when I left and there was only 15 <laughs> minutes left. And I believe Midland High is playing right now. and. They should win, and if they do, there'll be another match between Dow and Midland High on Wednesday night, so that should be fun. Um, secondly, I was reading through my uh, Dow High newspaper that I got ahead of time from my children, and I thought it was interesting that Dow High has a vision statement now. So I was reading through that, and their vision statement is to be the best high school in Michigan. So I thought that was interesting they did that. And the last thing, a couple weeks ago, I had an interesting text from my neighbor across the street. If you guys remember last um, January for School Board Appreciation Month, we were each, um, they donated a book mm -hmm. for each of us to a library. And my neighbor across the street, he just started kindergarten at Adams and he brought home the book, they opened it up and there was the placard with my name on it. So my neighbor texted me to tell me that. So I thought that was, that was a neat thing. So. That's all I have tonight. Good. Okay, we're good. Yeah, the, uh, I know that there's been a lot of promotion out there regarding the November 4th election, and I know that there's uh, good luck to the candidates uh, running for the Board of Ed seats. Um, with the, uh, you know, just I think the message out there that it's it's zero tax increase. I know I've seen some of the materials in the, the schools and newspapers and so forth, and. Mike, I think you had a nice um, letter into the Midland Daily News. So uh, just with this being 25% of our entire budget and not being any tax increase, hopefully that message is reaching home. I don't think we can uh, assume that everybody is going to get the information. So I definitely think uh, trying to get out to a few parents, let them know how essential it is. That was, that was about like the message was last time, how essential it was 
for the renewal, for the enhancement millage, I think that definitely, um, I think the message is getting out there. I'm looking forward to that going forward for the district. So just a few weeks. On to you. Nice. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, one thing I've noticed uh, the last several weeks going to sporting events at the high schools is it seems like the student sections are much larger this year and a lot of energy going on and I have to commend our athletic directors for bringing forth the idea of allowing the students to have passes to those games so that uh, could really build uh, more uh, student camaraderie and participation there. So it looks like it's working. Uh, I hope it's working out on the financial end as well. But um, it, it sure is exciting to be at a game and see all the kids. Well, congratulations to the Shining Stars. We're so, uh, we're so fortunate to have so many really wonderful employees in the Midland Public Schools. And also, I just want to say that I really enjoyed the presentation tonight on the IBPYP program because it just made me realize Midland, the Midland Public Schools have always turned out very high achieving students, academic achievers. But now we are able to also um, graduate, we will be able to graduate students who are also, um, I wrote these down, mindful, creative, respectful, tolerant, caring, high achieving students. I think that's wonderful. Uh, not just students, but citizens of the world. I think they'll really be able to make their world a good place to live, and I think that's great. I'm so happy we were able to do that. And there's a little bit of self-interest in, on my part in that, too, because I'm thinking that 30 years from now, when I am really old, these are the people who will be making important decisions that will affect <laughs> my quality of life. And I, th I feel good about that. I feel really, I, th I take some comfort in that. So um, I just really enjoy that, and that's really all I have to say. To piggyback on that a little bit, too, um, I see that we have an invitation to the uh, MPS Fiesta Hispania, and if no one's been to that, it's, it's very fun. The fifth grade students with the parents and guardians um, have this event and where local community members come in from um, the Hispanic population and community, and the students and families have a chance to play games and interact, and, and it just builds on that theme of global and inquiry and, and all those wonderful things we heard with PYP tonight. And I know I've been able to go a couple times in the past, and it's an evening well spent. They have, they have great food to sample as well, and dancing and music. Unfortunately, I will be in uh, Grand Rapids at the State School Board Conference, so I won't be able to come this year, but thank you for the invite. Um, I was, had the privilege to go see Great Gatsby that Midland High put on the other night. What another wonderful performance. Boy, they opened up that curtain and you really almost felt like you were back in the 20s. The costuming, the dancing, the music, the acting was all phenomenal. So thank you to everyone that was involved with that to put on a great, a great production. And I could hear from my house, I couldn't go to the band showcase because I was doing my um, duty being at the the uh, League of Women's Voter candidate forum Wednesday night, but on my way home, I could hear the band playing um, over at Midland High, so I know that's just a, an incredible opportunity for so many bands in the area, and I'm sure they, they had a wonderful time. And I would, I would encourage people to make sure they get out and vote November 4th with the millage renewal and the candidate election. And I think that's it. I'll, I'll maybe comment on a couple of them. The showcase is always near and dear to my heart. My kids were in school, and uh, it is really interesting from tiny little schools to big schools mm -hmm. and the performances are great. Um, I'd like to thank the league and the AAUW for the forum and for the candidates for participating and for Angela for trying to participate in spite <laughs> of a work <laughs> commitment. Yes. Uh, it was nice that you uh, got a letter and, uh, and everybody for spending your time to do that. Betty gave me an option. It was either write a letter or send my husband. Ah, <laughs> good choice. <Yeah. laughs> That's what Kurt said, too. I just, I just urge all of you to get out there and talk to as many people as you can So, uh, uh, for two reasons. Number one, for your own candidacy. But number two, the more candidates speak and we speak to people in the community, the more they understand the issues that are going on. And if you provide them a future, uh, a future sounding board for them to come back to the board. So. Um, thank uh, Gary and Christy, and for those who nominated them. I, I love that this is more of a peer recognition than anything, and that, that's great. And then lastly, urge our voters, I can't urge you guys out there enough uh, for our renewal of our whole harmless and our operating millage. It is absolutely critical. Uh, it's a showstopper 
if it doesn't pass, uh, it's not like the state backstops that money. It doesn't come. It doesn't come. It's no tax increase, a, a rate increase at all. It's just continuing of the status quo that's been in place for many, many years now. And uh, so we appreciate your support. You so could do. Mike. And I too want to thank the League of Women Voters Amer and the American Association of University of Women. What great partners they've been. In my short time here, I've realized that. And they did a great job uh, last Wednesday night with the candidates and the, the two hopeful candidates are in the audience as well tonight and yeah, everyone did a great job. I enjoyed the answers and um, I think uh, Midland Daily News said it well that most of you were on the same page and it was about kids and doing the right things for schools. So as superintendent with seven bosses, I'm pretty comfortable with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, February bond proposal, it, it, um, as mentioned earlier, we have a meeting with Treasury on Wednesday, and so um, we really, you know, I, I've had some people ask for more details on that, and the details can't be given until you've gone to Treasury and you've had an approval to do anything. And so um, we're working behind the scene as if we would get approval in order to have the information to replace, to give to the community, but until you and most people don't understand all the steps that schools have to take in order for that to happen. And so we have uh, that meeting on Wednesday, and then we do have a special board meeting on Monday scheduled because you cannot approve what the Treasury approves until after they do that, and we can't wait until November to do that because the timeline doesn't work according to the state, and so we have to have a special meeting um, next Monday for that piece of it. The November is, uh, special meeting is another step in that whole process and we're assuming all those steps will make and uh, be approved to go forward and once we are um, lots of information will be forthcoming and I think um, most people will see the message that we have there as well. Martin Luther King Day, if you recall we had a number of students come visit us I think it was last June um, in regards to the school calendar which had been adopted already for the 14-15 school year, and they were looking for Martin Luther King to be a student holiday. Um, even though that calendar had been adopted, we were able to put together the calendar committee to have the students um, do the same style presentation they did to you, to our calendar committee. Um, not sure if the 14-15 school year will get done or not. It's kind of stuck in that committee at this point in time, um, but it could be. Um, a little worried about the timeline of that little bit of a change. Not that they, the parents and students would be off that day, but there would be half that day would have to go somewhere on our calendar, which would change some things for parents and students. So we'll see where that develops, but certainly we're looking at it, and that may be something um, if they don't make the 14, 15 year, they'll make the 15, 16 school year. Um, letter of understanding. Um, we had uh, two salary schedules out there. Uh, one of the salary schedules for the teachers was a schedule that no is obsolete, it's no longer needed, and so it had gone through where um, back when teachers had to take 18 credit hours to get their, keep their certificate, and we had, we had paid accordingly to that. Now today they can um, do what we call sketches, um, continue education units for teachers to get the certification. And so we had two scales that were kind of parallel to each other, paid the same, and so we've got a letter of agreement to remove one of those salary schedules moving forward. So really it's just an adjustment to today's standards set by the state of Michigan going forward. Summer tax resolution, um, we will be taking action on that in November. Is that right, Mr. Cooper? October. Okay. Okay, and this, we'll do a special meeting. Um, something I do want you to begin to think about. The reason schools do summer tax collections is, is because of cash flow. And, and you, you, for years, my understanding, have, have collected 50% of the city taxes, none of the township, during that summer tax collection. And um, with our cash flow issue that we know we're facing a year from now, um, should we be looking at 100%? Well, beginning to look at that, um, one of the issues I see would be for some of those people with limited income out there knowing that suddenly their entire bill comes due um, this summer versus paying a part this summer and next February. But I think we should look at it, but then if we do make that decision and give our taxpayers lots of notice, it's just they're paying the same amount, it's just when it's due, and to give them lots of notice so they can make that adjustment. Something to look at that would assist us in our cash flow during that month we do not receive school aid payment. 
we already talked about the band trailer, and I sent you a picture on that, and it looks very nice, and another great partnership with lots of people in our community to make that occur. Fall count day was uh, Wednesday, October 1st. Uh, it's difficult for a district like ours to give you an exact number at, at this soon, and we're a little hesitant until we get them audited and checked anyway, to be honest. Um, in our district, uh, we get pieces from parochial schools where we service them and they add up to whole pieces and, and some of that's a little difficult to, to uh, get into the count as well. But it appears that we, we will be above our budgeted, blended budgeted amount, which is a good thing. Um, I'm still not gonna tell you how much I think we're above. <laughs> I don't think Bob will either. Gary's more of a little op optimistic. You might be able to get that answer out of Gary, but I think we're waiting um, a, a few more weeks before we can release the, exactly what that means for our budget. It's not anything that's gonna change the direction we're in, but it certainly is a good news going forward. And board meeting dates. Um, uh, we've had a request f from a board member who has a conflict um, to look at board meeting dates when we hold those. And we're going to propose, or we did kind of propose to in the Friday letter, um, that we switch these board meetings to the first and third when there's two, two meetings a month, and the third on a one meeting month. I believe I said that right. And um, of course, we would not adopt those into your organizational meeting in January. So that would be for the second half of the year going forward if there is no conflicts with anybody else. And so we did do some checking around town. When is the city council meetings and some of those pieces? We can avoid some, but city council also has, uh, they rotate it, was it? Is that what we found, Cindy? Mm -hmm. And they rotate a little bit. So we can only miss them at certain nights. So there's still gonna be some conflicts with the city on, on those meeting dates. But if all works well, and I haven't heard from any of you that won't, that's what our plan is to propose to you in January. So, so I'd like to know the Mondays you get in that Friday letter don't work for you, that there's a bunch more that don't work for than does work for, we can always revert. That's what we're looking for. I think this far ahead, it's probably not a big issue unless somebody has a standing meeting on the third Monday of a month. And that's what the problem we had with one of the board members, a, stand, uh, a conflict going forward every time, so. And that is all I have. Any other questions or comments? With none, we will stand adjourned.